Well, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Richard Van Eyck. I'm the Director of Infection Prevention and Epidemiology for Bronson Healthcare. Today, we're going to talk about the issue of a vaccine for COVID-19, sort of compared to having the COVID-19 virus or the disease. And um, I have two um, uh, great colleagues to join me today. And uh, I have Dr. Larry Morgan, uh, and I have Kara Klein, a nurse practitioner. So Dr. Morgan, perhaps you can introduce yourself first and tell our listeners um, a little bit about uh, what you do and your experience with COVID, and then Kara, please. Thanks, Dr. Randy. So uh, my name is Larry Morgan. I'm the System Medical Director for Neurocritical Care and for Stroke here at Bronson. And um, uh, my role sort of changed a little bit as the pandemic hit, uh, and uh, I started taking over kind of primary responsibility for the ICU level patients with COVID. Uh, and so, uh, you know, unfortunately, I've been pretty involved uh, in the care of the sickest patients with COVID for quite a long time now. Mm -hmm. Kara, tell us about your work. Uh, my name is Kara Klein. I'm a nurse practitioner um, with Family Medicine on Schaefer Street. My experience with COVID has been on the outpatient setting. So I see mostly patients through video visit that have relatively mild illness that are managed at home and fully recover. Although we have had some instances where we've had patients who had had to be admitted and unfortunately a few patients that have passed away. Why are we interested in this particular topic now? Well, it's based on what people are telling us. And, 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 and some people are afraid of the, the pandemic, of course. It's disrupted our lives. Um, it's very frightening. It has everyone concerned, including us. Um, but what we're finding is that some people are kind of afraid of the wrong things. And in particular, people are afraid of the vaccine and they don't seem to be so afraid of the COVID disease. And so we want to sort of clarify for people um, uh, what's going on with people, what happens to you when you get a vaccine compared to what happens to you when we get um, uh, the, the disease. So let's start with you, Kara. You've given the vaccine to your patients and um, what, what are vaccines supposed to do and, and what does it normally feel like after you take a vaccine? So all vaccines are, you know, developed to help prevent infection and spread of disease. Um, for the COVID vaccine, the common reported side effects, um, which have been very consistent for my patients as well, pain, swelling, redness at the ejection site, um, as well as maybe some fatigue, headache, muscle soreness, um, after, but these are usually short-term side effects after infection, usually 24 to 72 hours. Um, to prevent side effects, you know, we recommend that you use cool, clean washcloths to the injection site and drink lots and lots of fluid. Lots of concerns for the, um, if you're getting a Moderna or Pfizer vaccine, that you have more severe side effects after the second dose, which tends to be true, but again, are not long-term and very short-lived. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good. So Dr. Morgan, I, I, unfortunately, <clears throat> you have to give us sort of the, uh, the bad news, and that is what it's like to have COVID disease. So it seems like the COVID virus can cause different kinds of disease or what we would call different presentations. Can you tell us a little bit about what your patients experience when they have COVID disease? Yeah, Dr. Randy, so uh, the, the sort of um, spectrum of disease that we see with COVID uh, is pretty wide. Uh, and so the vast majority of people tend to have fairly mild symptoms, but the trouble is, is that we're not very good at predicting who's going to get really, really sick. Uh, and, and of course, some people are getting very sick and actually dying. You know, uh, COVID is now uh, the, the single deadliest event in the U.S. history. Uh, it has killed more Americans than any other event uh, throughout all of history, including all of the wars that we have ever had. Uh, so this really is no joke. And when it comes down to how sick people can get, 
it's pretty miserable when you get sick enough to make it to the ICU. If you think about any time in which you've been really out of breath, uh, that's sort of what these people are feeling like all the time. Uh, you know, if you think about uh, the, the end of a, a big exercise routine and you're really out of breath and you sort of feel like maybe you overdid it a little bit, that's how these people are feeling just sitting in bed. Uh, you know, and in terms of the spectrum of disease, it's not just affecting the respiratory tract, it's affecting the entire body. And we're seeing everything from blood clots to liver dysfunction to kidney dysfunction to brain dysfunction. Uh, and, and all of these are tied in together, right? So if somebody's developing blood clots, this can cause things like heart attacks, it can cause strokes. And it's not only just getting through the points of surviving the disease, but people that do survive, you know, a third of them uh, are still having symptoms more than six months out, uh, you know, so it doesn't come down to something as simple as a number uh, like mortality and survivability. Uh, we know that most people that get sick with COVID survive it, uh, but that's not necessarily the most important feature. The most important feature is what is the quality of life like at the end of it, uh, you know, and of course, when you do get really sick, uh, some of these people are requiring, uh, you know, intubations, uh, breathing tubes being put in, being placed on ventilators uh, for prolonged amounts of time. Uh, and, and all of this is, is extremely uh, miserable. I mean, it, it's extremely uncomfortable to watch. And, and many of the people that get to that point just don't survive. And it, it's terrible to watch them go through this and their families go through watching them uh, as they deteriorate along this track, knowing that the severe disease and the death can be prevented uh, the vast majority of time by a simple treatment like the vaccine beforehand. Uh, and so that's kind of the saddest part for me watching this over and over again is thinking that, uh, you know, that this is something that could have been prevented. And when it reaches that point, many times, uh, you know, we feel kind of helpless in our ability to, to be able to improve their outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Kara, Dr. Morgan just described what it's like to have COVID-19 disease in the hospital. You've seen your own patients um, with COVID-19 infection that are not sick enough to be in the hospital, but describe what that looks like um, and, what, and what experiences those patients have uh, at home. Um, patients that we see at home can have a variety of symptoms, including pain and fatigue. A lot of times they're describing that they're not able to get out of bed. They're having high fevers. Um, we're having them purchase home pulse oximeters so that they can measure what their oxygenation statuses are because otherwise they have that, as Dr. Morgan alluded to, the shortness of breath. We have no idea to know what are they actually oxygenating and do they need to go to the emergency room for evaluation. Some patients have mild symptoms where they only lose taste or smell for a few days and then generally get over it and feel much better by the end. So it's really just kind of patient dependent. And there's really, you know, as Dr. Morgan said, there's no way to tell who's going to get very sick because we have lots of patients who have had no medical problems, develop COVID and get very, very ill. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about something new or something that's new to me. I don't know of too many other diseases that do this. And we put different names on it. We call it long COVID or long haul COVID or post-acute sequelae of COVID. That's the medical word for it. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult to disease uh, to, to manage. So Kara, can you tell us if you have any patients that have that now and how are they doing and um, how long have they struggled with, with this, this disease? And uh, is there anything that you can do for them? Um, I do have a few patients that have had uh, the post-COVID sequel. Um, the longest patient was diagnosed over a year ago with COVID and has still struggled with shortness of breath um, and has been actually referred to a post-COVID clinic at uh, Cleveland Clinic for monitoring and diagnosis and, you know, because they do a broad range of things for this patient. Um, my most severe patient actually had a heart attack and stroke during his COVID and he was, um, prior to this, this patient was otherwise healthy. 
Um, and he is still dealing with severe life altering events. And that's been at least six months since his um, infection. Patients with um, mild cases of COVID have had, you know, still don't have the right taste or smell. And that's, you know, up to three months out from their infection. So there's just, you know, no telling who's going to get the long haulers or post COVID sequel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've and how bad it's going to be and how long it's going to last. So a lot of the treatment, because there is no cure, is based on the symptomology of that they're having. I've heard um, numbers that, that up to 30% of people that have COVID can, can have those long lingering aspects of it, more severe, less severe. A lot of these are neurologic. Um, Dr. Morgan, can you tell us a little bit about what you think is happening to these patients um, when they have these more severe symptoms? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, we know that many viruses have the capability of being able to cross what we call the blood-brain barrier. So your brain is a little bit different than other, uh, other organs in your body, and it's a little bit more protected uh, from uh, some of the outside things that uh, we might take in in terms of uh, foods and drinks that we have and infections that we might have. But many viruses have that ability to cross that blood-brain barrier that's an extra piece of protection for your brain. And, and we know that COVID is one of those. Uh, in fact, uh, that's part of the initial symptoms that we often see that people get in terms of the loss of taste and smell. Uh, it uses receptors that are found uh, in your nose uh, that tie directly to your brain. Uh, and so we know that it can cross the blood brain barrier. We know that it can get in and cause direct neuroinvasion uh, and damage to the brain uh, itself. Uh, we have very early evidence uh, of that finding uh, and isolating uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 um, in the cerebral spinal fluid for, for patients very early in the, the disease process. And so I think that some of this is related to the direct neuroinvasion from the virus. And some of this is also a result of the complicated uh, issues that they have with other organs in their body. You know, the, the brain is uh, so fragile and unforgiving. It relies on all of the other organs to function properly. Otherwise it won't function properly. And so many times uh, the brain is sort of the victim, if you will, rather than and the culprit. Uh, and sometimes it's a result of the injury to every other organ that's going on uh, that causes the brain to dysfunction as well. Well, let's stay with you um, for our last uh, topic or our last question. What do you tell your patients about the vaccine? Uh, did you advise them to get it? And, um, and how, how does that conversation go? Yeah, absolutely. I advise all of my patients uh, to get vaccinated uh, because as we've touched on many of these topics, uh, you know, uh, we just don't know who's going to get really sick and, uh, you know, it's just not worth the risk. And the risks associated with the vaccine are so low. You know, the, the monitoring for this vaccine is far and above uh, that of monitoring of any vaccine in history. And in the safety profile for it is remarkable. And uh, its efficacy, its ability to prevent severe disease and death is, is better than just about any vaccine out there. I mean, it, it's really a very, very effective and very safe preventative treatment uh, that really could save your life. Uh, and so I absolutely advise all of my patients to get it. Uh, and unfortunately, many of them that I run into, uh, you know, it's sort of too late for them initially. Uh, but if they're able to survive and get through their initial infection, I tell them as soon as you get out of the hospital, you need to get vaccinated still uh, because we know natural immunity is not always enough and it wanes over time. Uh, and so even though you've been infected with COVID previously, uh, that is not sufficient protection. And the good news for you is that if you get vaccinated after being infected, uh, you know, the evidence suggests you have around four times the protection of someone who's just been vaccinated. So uh, it is still very, very important because we don't know what's going to be coming down the pipeline in terms of new variants. You know, we, we thought we had seen the worst of it uh, with the alpha variant. And then new ones kept popping up. And obviously the Delta variant, which is the vast majority of what we're seeing now is much, much, much more transmissible and to some degree, a little bit worse in terms of disease. And so we don't know what the next variant is gonna look like, but it might be much worse than what we've experienced so far. And so it's really important to protect yourself uh, and protect others uh, from, from spreading this. Mm -hmm. 
And Kara, can you tell us how your conversations go with your patients about the COVID vaccine? Yeah, um, along the lines of Dr. Morgan, I recommend all of my patients get the COVID vaccine. You know, family medicine, primary care, that's preventative medicine. That's what we are supposed to do. So I advise all my patients hand washing, wearing a mask indoors or in crowded outdoor areas and get the vaccine. That's the only thing that we know that can uh, prevent this and prevent long haulers or COVID sequel or prevent hospitalization. So if that's something that we can do to prevent it, that's what we recommend that you do. That is a great way to end our time together. So I thank you so much for sharing your time with us and our listeners. And um, I'm, I wanna thank our listeners for tuning in and, and thank both of our participants for, uh, for sharing all of their great medical information about COVID with us. So uh, now I would say goodbye and please stay safe. Thank you.